All right, let's turn to Luke. Luke 18. Luke 18, starting at verse 9. I'm reading from the NIV version. And I'm really excited about this word. I really pray that um, God will just bless it to do something special in our hearts and in our minds. Um, all right, are you there? Luke 18, I hope you're taking notes. I hope you got your highlighters and your pens ready. I hope you got a journal. I hope you're taking notes on your iPhone. We don't want to just hear it and be like, that was good. And then you don't remember what it was on Wednesday, right? We want to meditate on it and chew on the word of God. So let's start. Luke 18, verse 9, it says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. It already starts off with a whole situation. Verse 10 says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He could not even look up to heaven, but beat his, his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other one, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who, are, who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen. May God bless God's holy word. This is taken from our lectionary scriptures for this week. And our subject today is called Plot Twist. Plot Twist. We're talking about a plot twist. Are you like me? Do you love a good movie with a plot twist? Anybody? Those are like the best movies where you never see it coming. Unlike a lot of the Netflix movies right now, I figure it out in the first, and I'd be like, mm, they did it, I already know. Mm -mm. Like, you already figured it out. There's nothing like a good plot twist. All right, I hope I'm not being a spoiler alert, but did anyone see The Sixth Sense? Y'all remember that movie? Wasn't that a great, what was, what's our guy? Um, Bruce Willis. I didn't see it. I'm sorry if you didn't see this. I'm giving a spoiler alert. He was dead the whole time. I didn't know. Who knew? They had us out here thinking this man is out here doing all the things, and he was actually dead. Anybody see the uh, Book of Eli with Denzel Washington? I didn't know he was blind the whole time. He was out here fighting folks. I'm so sorry if you hadn't seen this. It's been out for a while. That's your bad. You should have watched it. Um, but... I, who knew he was blind? There's something about a good plot twist. A plot twist is an unexpected development in the story. You never saw it coming. Well, many of Jesus' parables and stories featured surprise reversals and shocking endings, right? If you don't believe me, read your Bible. It's like better than a novel, better than Netflix. I'd be trying to tell y'all it's really good up in here. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Yeah, that, the Samaritan was actually the good guy in the story. The Jewish people never saw that coming. They were like, the Samaritans? There ain't no way, right? Remember the, the parable of the rich man who built his barns? He said, I'm going to chill out, eat, drink, and be merry. And he didn't know his life was required that night. Plot twist. Uh, there was a king who threw a banquet, and all his guests that he invited had excuses. So he was like, okay, cool. I'm going to invite all the poor, the crippled, the lame. All y'all, come on. We're going to the streets. All y'all come into the house. They never saw that coming. And remember the prodigal son. Turns out the oldest son was actually the in-house prodigal. Who knew? 
right? Plot twist. All Jesus is always, this was his M.O. in storytelling. He liked to shock his audiences with these stories. So when we get to this passage that we're in in Luke 8, 18, when we get to our passage, Jesus is already talking about prayer. He has already talked about the parable of the persistent widow, the one who just wouldn't let that old judge alone till he, she got to what she wanted, right? And he was like, well, while I'm on the subject of prayer, I'm going to tell a story. And Jesus tells a story about two people going to the same place but having two different experiences. Doesn't that happen a lot? Have you ever seen somebody at church, two, two different people in church but having two different experiences? Somebody crying and weeping before the Lord, the other person sleep. Two places, two, same place, two different experiences. Somebody shouting and leaping, and the other person got their arms crossed like they doing too much. Same place, two different experiences. Now, when he told this story, most of Jesus' listeners would have immediately and wrongly assumed that they knew who the hero and the villain were in this story. As soon as he said Pharisees and tax collectors, they was like, oh, this is a no-brainer. We already know how this going to go. This is like a dumb moment, like, duh, like we already know. Like, as soon as they said the names, they were like, okay, we already know how this is going to work out. Because, let's talk about the Pharisees. Y'all, most of y'all know this, but the, the Pharisees were strict adherences to God's law. They adhered to God's law. The common people considered them the epitome of orthodoxy. Like, they were admired by the people. People would be like, look at them. They could just, they could follow the law so good. If only we could be like them. If only we could be as dedicated as them. But, when, you know, we give the Pharisees a hard time. We do. We talk about them a lot. We talk about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. We be like, look at them, just not believing in Jesus. Like, we give them a really hard time, but they actually played a really important uh, role in Jewish society. They were the keepers of the law. They were, to make, they were the ones who were making sure everyone's following the commandments. We own it up and up. We're not going to lose our heritage. We're not going to let these Roman people, you know, take away our culture. They were really good guys for the most part. Um, but the problem is they took ten, the Ten Commandments that the Lord gave and made 613 rules and regulations out of Ten Commandments. They were a little zealous. They took a lot, right? So they were really into it. They were really, you know, focused, we can say. So that was the Pharisees. Now we got the little tax collector. You see all throughout the scriptures, they're always talking about tax collectors and people, um, you know, and it went, as soon as Jesus would have said tax collector, it's like the whole crowd would have booed. He'd be like, there was a Pharisee, yeah, and then the tax collector, boo. That would have been an instant. They would have been like, no, don't even say their names. Um, because they were sellouts. They were considered sellouts to Rome. Now, when we hear tax collectors, we think H&R Block. Like we not we don't it don't we don't put it together. We thinking about our local tax person who doing our we gonna see them in February or something like right. So it doesn't really it doesn't really connect with us. But then I want you to see I want you to see how much they are hated. Um, they were equivalent to a black person. All right, y'all with me? Being paid by the KKK to collect monthly a monthly neighborhood fee. Let's just say it was a monthly neighborhood fee. And then on top, insult on top of injury, that said person would have the nerve to up the fee just so that they could, you know, line their pockets with the rest. Like the KKK would be like, yeah, just charge them $5. I'm so like, cool, I'm going to charge them 50 they like, do whatever. So you have a group of people walking around in their own hoods who were sellouts, walking around in Gucci, Driving Bentleys, whatever the equivalent was in the ancient times. Looking good while walking through the neighborhood, taking money from their own people, getting paid by the man. Do you understand why they were so hated now? Do you understand why they would be instantly booed? But things are never as you think, because sometimes there's a plot twist. All right, y'all tracking with me? 
As the story goes, it becomes time for prayer. It was a prayer time at the temple. And you know how prayer goes. You know that's the time when people want to show out at prayer meetings. Anybody ever been to a church and that was their time to shine? They was like, oh, <clears throat> yes, I would like to go ahead and pray. And they started speaking in, like, Shakespearean. And it was like, I, we were just down at the store. When, when did this Shakespearean voice come from? Like, this is where most people, they feel like this is their theater training. They're ready to go. And I'm going to read it to you from the message version. This is what the, what the Pharisee said at prayer time. He was posed and he prayed like this. Oh, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people the robbers, the crooks, the adulterers, or heaven forbid, like this tax man, I fast twice a week and tithe my income. This was his prayer, saints. Um, the Pharisee basically talked about himself. That was the, the prayer was about him. The prayer was that he was grateful for himself. That was the prayer. And there was at least four I statements in that prayer. I don't, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a prayer for you. But then we can't be always mad because how, check our last prayer life. What was your, what was your prayer time with God about? Was it all about you, yourself, and yourself? I was going to say me, myself, and I, but that didn't work out. Um, is it about us four and no more? What is your prayer time surrounding? Is it all about what you want to talk about and what you need and what, what is it? Is it all about you? This is what the Pharisees makes us think about. Because he was doing a lot. He was, he was. The, the fast that Moses commanded, they was only supposed to fast once a year during Passover. But the Pharisees took it upon themselves to fast every Monday and Thursday. And that was just bread and water. They was like, we, do, we, only, we not eat nothing but bread and water. That, like, we holy. And then they, not only did they just tied on their earnings. They tied on every, they gave a tenth on everything that they, that they acquired. So if it's, it's mints, it's, um, you know, whatever, they would give the Lord back, whatever it was, not just money. So they really thought he was going above and beyond. Can you see what, how he's feeling about himself? I was going above and beyond. So therefore I have a merit badge of achievement. Surely, I have God's favor. Look at all the things I do. Look at all the things I do for the poor and for the people and how I'm just holding on to these rules. Surely God loves me and favors me. I'm so glad I'm not like the other people. Sounds a little, I don't know if y'all grew up in a strict church, but it kind of sounds familiar. A lot of people who look down on others because they don't share the same convictions. They don't share the same dress code. They don't share the same dietary preferences. That we tend to look down on one another, you know, if we, people aren't looking up to, me, to doing the things that I'm doing. The problem with this guy is that he used other people as his standard of righteousness. Are y'all with me? And since in his view, he surpassed all of them, he celebrated his own virtue. I'm a pretty good guy. I, you know what? I'm all right. I'm out here killing the game. I'm doing good, right? Um, thinking himself better than everyone else, he assumed that God must be pleased with him. God got to love me. Look, they don't even, they, they look at them eating over there. I'm not even eating. God loves me. But the, the, where he went wrong and where we go wrong is comparison. Somebody say comparison. Comparison, comparison, get us in trouble every time. Comparison is the, is the, the thief of all joy. Comparison is what causes us to look on our timeline and sigh. <sighs> I wish I had that. Must be nice. Boy, I wish I had somebody. Wish I had a house. Whoa, look at them. I'm the same age, and they doing more than me. Wow, comparison. We do it. We do it to I'll raise my hand and say I'll do it even with the Pharisees and his comparison. We even do it with sin. Like we say, you know what? Now, I may do a little something from time to time, but at least I'm not doing that. Like they went too far. I don't know about what they doing. Like, that's too, no, no, look, I might dibble and dabble, but they really out there just wowing. Look at them. 
We compare ourselves to other people's sins. It's easy to compare ourselves to people who do not measure up to us, at least in our own eyes. We've all did it before. At least I'm not a serial killer. At least I'm not, a, I'm not hurting nobody. We've all done it before. Y'all getting quiet on me. I don't know how y'all feeling. You all right online? They got quiet on me. I'll admit it, I did it too. We all in this together. But the tax collector, on the other hand, he knew that he fell short. His only hope was God's grace, which is God's undeserved favor. He already knew. He already knew it was all bad for him. He didn't have the testimony that the Pharisee had at all. Matter of fact, he was still living in the current sin condition that he was benefiting from. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, they like, I was in the world and it was not. Sometimes when you were sinning and in the world, you, you look like you winning. He was benefiting from sin. He was rich. He was out here looking nice. So he was benefiting from it, but there was something that was still wrong with his soul. There was, when in his prayer, there was no self-congratulations. There was no summary of his good deeds. There was no sense that God ought to feel honored or obligated to him. But there was one recognition of his need for God's mercy. That's the one thing that he could depend on. But, you know, I, I, I actually like this guy. I actually like this tax collector. You know why I like him? He's, he's one of my, I, I'm, he, he on my list of, of good Bible characters. I like this guy because he kept showing up to church. <laughs> he kept coming to the temple. He kept meeting and congregating with a bunch of people who hated him. This says a lot about this guy that he would keep showing up into a hostile environment. That he kept somewhere, if you think about it, peel back his story, somewhere he had a relationship with God. Somewhere he knew if I could just get back to church, if I could just get to a safe place, if I could just get to a place where I could ask God to just forgive me. He knew he had to get back. It was something about in his soul that make him, made him say, let me go to church. Y'all already been there before you did too much? You was like, ooh, let me, let, me, let me take myself to church and stop playing. But something, even though something inside of him knew he needed God, when he got to the house of God, he felt even more ostracized when he got there. Isn't that something? People come to church looking for God, and then they end up being further marginalized when they get to church. That's not how that should be. This is not the, this, the, the um, congregation that we want to be. This is why it is important in our church settings for us to be a place where anybody can come, where anybody can feel free to connect, to encounter with God. Anybody can come in here without looking, being looked down on or being felt marginalized, as long as you're sitting down and not being a distraction. So if y'all coming in off the street acting, you know, we're going to have to escort you out. But if you, <laughs> we got the good deacon in here. But... Other than that, anybody should be able to come here and feel the love of God. Are y'all with me? Is that the kind of place that we're going to have? So, in the theme of a plot twist, Jesus said at the end of the story that it was the tax collector, not the Pharisee, who went home justified. Isn't that something? It was the tax collector, not the Pharisee. Uh, who was justified, which means he was declared righteous before God. He went home with, with credit on his books from God. He went home with debt cancellation from God. He went home with a, with a clean slate from God. Romans uh, 3, 23 and 24, I love this verse. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. What is it? It's a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Somebody say gift again. Justification is a gift. And I know y'all have heard this before, but it's just as if I've never sinned. This is the gift that God is offering us. It's quite amazing. Matter of fact, it's 
almost unbelievable. As a matter of fact, it's literally too good to be true sometimes. That God will give you what you don't deserve just as if you've never sinned. This is what the tax collector went home with. And this is what Jesus provides for us. This is what our faith is based on. Justification. Something that is purely a gift that you can earn through performance. So who ended up being the the hero and the villain in this story? Turns out it was a plot twist. Whose prayer did God really answer? In seeking God's forgiveness, the tax collector received an answer prayer. So the biggest takeaway I want us to walk away with this day is in verse 14. It was the closing verse, and it says, for all those who humble themselves, I'm sorry, all those who exalt themselves shall be humbled, and those who humble themselves shall be exalted. Come on, sit in that verse for just a minute. All those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves shall be exalted. The tax collector understood that he was a sinful man before a holy God, and he humbled himself in God's sight, pleading for mercy so that he might find salvation and restoration. But the Pharisee, on the other hand, was self-righteous. He gave his own self-righteousness and self-sufficient. And according to James 4 and 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Isn't that a verse for you? God resists you. He's allergic to you. He can't even be around you. He's actively moving away from you. Even if you're trying to come in football when you stiff arm somebody, God is stiff arming you if you are proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Always remember, in the kingdom of God is always down the way up. It's always down. When you want to go up, it's always down. It's always a kingdom opposite. If you want to go, you want to get big, you want to blow up, go low. You want to, you want to be great, you got to serve. You got to get low. It's down the way up. So here's the big question. How do you be humble but yet confident? Right? You ever thought about that? How do you have positive self-esteem without it being like a humble brag? Like, you know, I don't want to brag, but I'm really humble. Like, I don't want to, like, make, I don't want to make a big deal about it, but I'm really a humble person. Like, I really take a lot. Like, how do we, how do we justify the two? Because we want to be, we want to be confident. We want to show up, we want to show up in places, walking in our giftings and our talents and our anointings. Then how do, we, how do we humble ourselves? What is this verse talking about? How do we do that? So three ways how to humble yourself. I hope you're taking notes. I'm about to give you three scriptures. Please write these down so you can meditate on them throughout the week. My God. First scripture is 1 Peter 5 and 6. 1 Peter 5 and 6. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. Woo! That's a verse for you. If you ever needed to memorize a verse, this might be your one that you might want to start with. It said, I love this verse because it doesn't say, wait for God to humble you. What does the verse say? Humble yourself. You do it. You got, we all have a choice. It's a very intentional. Now, you can wait for the Lord to humble you. Anybody ever had for the Lord to humble you? You got a choice. You can humble yourself or you can let the Lord humble you. I'm going to choose option one. It says, let, you, you can take it upon yourself. You humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Don't wait for God to humble you because God surely will. It says, the ca- actually, the tax collector, he is the one that had the correct prayer posture. Do y'all know that? He had the correct prayer posture. Do you know what his posture was? Lord, without you, I am trash. God, without you, I'm horrible. Do y'all know that? That's the correct posture. That's who we really are. God, without you, I am no good. Y'all know you. Do you know you? Do you know you without God? Do you know you without the Holy Ghost? 
Do you know you without the grace of God sitting on you? Ever had God sit on you? You ever had God hold your mouth shut when you're about to say something? I know me without God, and it's not good. Y'all don't want to see that me without God. So his posture was actually correct. God, without you, if it wasn't for your grace, if it wasn't for your keeping power, if it wasn't for you, God, without you, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. We always have to remember that when we start getting a little puffed up, like, you know, I'm actually doing good out here. I'm actually I'm better than them. You always have to remember who we really are without the grace of God. We are nothing. We are lo- like a base, like, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I am just a sinner saved by grace. It is the grace of God that keeps us, that holds us together. God, without you, I'm nothing. Next verse is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Write this one down. It's a good one. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. What is it again? I sense a theme. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one could boast. I love that so much. First of all, the second time we're hearing a gift. It is a gift from God. It is literally something God is giving you. If I'm giving you a gift, all you need to do is to do what? You only got to do is receive it. If I'm giving you a gift, you don't be like, oh, let me, here, let me give you $20 for that. No, literally, it's a gift. Like, I'm not, I don't need anything from you for you to buy. All you have to do is receive. It is a free gift. God's grace and mercy is a gift from God. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. Does everybody get that? God has set it up in a manner where you can't take credit. I love that. It said it's not of works. At least anyone should boast. No, you can't take credit for this. You can't say, you know what, I have been pretty good since the age of 12. Like, I did not do that. I did not go to parties. I did not. Like, yo, you can't take credit for this. It says without the, without the grace and without the power of God, it says that you, there's, there, you can't boast about what God is doing. It says even in our best days, the Bible says our righteousness are as filthy rags. Even our best Even if we were doing it all out, even if we were just going to go for the gusto, God is so other that the chasm between, you can't even feel. We can't even achieve it. Do you know this? I was talking to my son. This was the purpose of the Ten Commandments. Y'all know that? The Ten Commandments were given to us just to show you that we can't do it. (laughs) We We can't even keep ten. Ten God gave. They added 613 when we couldn't even keep ten. And the word says if you violate one law, you violated the whole law. So we can't even keep ten. It was to show us that we needed a Savior, that the law was just a placeholder until the Savior would come and take away our sins. So it's nothing we can do to earn it. The bravado, the appearance, it means nothing. Resume, social status means nothing. Self-reliance means nothing. What counts is a heart that appreciates what God can give. Come on, it's not us. It's not us, it's him. So that means any acts of devotion towards God that you do, anything that you do towards God, it should be done out of love and out of a relationship with God, not by a means of earning God's favor through performance. Can I say that again? Anything you do from this point on as a devotional act to God, whether it be giving, fasting, charity, feeding the homeless, all these things should be done out of love and your relationship with God. Remember, I just want to be with you, God. That's where it's coming from. Not as a means to earn God's favor through performance. There's nothing you can do to earn God's love. Do you understand? I say this all the time, but there's nothing more you can do to make God love you. There's nothing less you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do but just be you. 
Be who God called you to be. So we're, can, we're not going to earn it. We're not going to do things for performance. We're not going to do things to compare ourselves to other people. Um, our last verse, and I love this verse. I, this is actually should be a whole nother sermon, this, this next verse, but I ain't going to hold you. I ain't going to hold you. Numbers 12 and 3. I absolutely love this verse. Numbers 12 and 3. This is a very... Um, this is a very obscure verse, and it says, now Moses, remember, our, we're talking about Moses, we're going back to the Old Testament. Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Go through your Sunday school chronological, you know, categories in your mind. All the things that Moses did starting from the plagues and the Red Sea and all the things in the wilderness, all the things Moses saw, the water from the rock, just name manna, quail, it's a whole lot. But there's this verse says that Moses, this great man of God, was the humblest person on the face of the earth. How can this be? I, I, you know, I, I thought about this a lot, and I thought about the verse that says that Moses would talk to God face to face as a man would talk to his friend. Y'all remember when Moses would go up on the mountain and stay with God for 40 days? And just 40 days, 40 nights, he stayed so long that the people was like, man, we're making our own God because we don't know where this guy went, right? He was with God, in the presence of God, talking face to face with God, in the glory with God. This actually allowed him to become the humblest person on earth. Follow me. The more time you spin in the presence of God, the more humble you will become. You know why? Because the more time you spend in the presence of God, the more you realize that, God, you are so God and I am so not. I am so overwhelmed by you. Remember in Isaiah, he said, I am undone. I am a man undone. I am not worthy. Anybody who saw Jesus face to face fell at his feet immediately. When you are, the more time you spend in the presence of God, the more humble you become. I don't have all the answers. I don't know it all. I'm blown away. God, you are, you are blowing my mind. I just can't. I don't even have words to speak. I'm just going to be quiet. Which tells me when a lot of people are really puffed up and arrogant and really like, you know, I had a dream from God last night. And you don't get dreams from God? I surely didn't know. When you, people make you feel like you're kind of less than, it makes me wonder how much time are you really spending in the presence of God? Because it actually works opposite. The more you're in the presence of God, the more humble you become. The more, the more low you get, the more quiet you get. You'd be like, I'm not going to even say nothing because I had a talk with God today. The more you, it says even the seraphim, the angel, they would cover their eyes before the presence of God. It's something about being around God that makes you go lower. Not higher, not puffed up, not a know-it-all, not trying to tell everybody the revelation you got and why you should dress like I dress and eat like I do. Like, No. It really makes you go lower. I heard something really good this week. It says, arrogance is just low self-esteem dressed up. And I was like, wow. Arrogance is low self-esteem just dressed up in a costume. So whenever you hear that, whenever you see that, I want you to take that as a note in your life. Like, no, I'm going to go lower. I'm going to go lower. I'm going to go lower. So I'm going to close with the story. Y'all ready? We're, le we're leaving on this. I didn't wear my watch. I don't even know why I'm doing this. <laughs> All right. An elderly carpenter was ready to retire. He told his employer of his plans to leave the house building business and live a more leisurely life with his wife, enjoying his extended family. He would miss the paycheck, but the time was right and he was ready to hang up his hammer. His boss was disappointed as the carpenter had been a loyal and diligent worker for many years. So he was sad to see him go. He asked for one last favor, requesting that the carpenter could build just one more house before retiring. Hesitantly, the carpenter said yes, but in time it was easy to see that his heart was just not in the work. 
He resorted to shoddy workmanship and using inferior materials as uh, using inferior materials. And it was unfortunate. It was an unfortunate way to end such a dedicated career. And at the end of the project, he sustained a significant injury, which further confirmed the reason why he should just hang up his, hang his hammer for good. When the boss came to expect the house, he handed the front door keys to the carpenter and said, this is your house. This is my gift to you. The carpenter was shocked. What a shame. If he had only known he was building his own house, he would have done it so differently. Now he would have to live in a home that he had not built none too well. Plot twist. Right? So it is with us. We are all in the process of building our lives. But how are you building your spiritual life? What are you building? Don't let your life be a plot twist. Don't let it be a plot twist when you stand before God face to face. Don't let it be said of you, after you tell God, but God, I did all these things in your name. I healed, I gave, I was doing the things, I laid hands, I was doing all these things. Don't let your plot twist be, I never knew you. I don't, I don't recall, I don't see you in the books here. But I did all these things in your name. Yeah, but I never knew you. Don't let this be the ultimate plot twist of your life. We have time to build in a correct way. We have time to build our lives on the word of God. We have time to build our lives on the principles of God. We have time to build a genuine relationship, God, that's not built on stuff, that's not built on what God can give me, but is built on, God, I just love you, and I just want to be with you. I just want to hang out with you. I just want to, I'm so appreciative of all your grace and your favor. I don't even want to do things to hurt your heart. I don't care about the rules and regulations. I just want to please you. This is the heart. This is the heart of a true believer. So just a few reflections before we go. You can play the spiritual music because then it will make me feel like we walk in in the glory. Yes, sir. Got Mike ready to sing? Oh, we going up. <laughs> Here's our reflection questions, and I'd like to get out the way. Which character do you relate to the most in the story? If you were to be really honest. What prayer posture will you take as a result of this story? How can you fully lean into God's grace instead of performance? We don't want a performance-based relationship with God. What would it look like to humble yourself without comparison going forward? How do you want to go forward? These are some things to think about during the week when you're spending time with God, when you're spending your time alone, you know, when it's all said and done, the Lord always looks at the motivation of our hearts. Why do we do the things we do? It's not just the things that we're doing, but why? Were you trying to get, you know, somebody to look at you, trying to get more followers? You was trying to let somebody say you did a good job, you want to be seen, you're trying to be famous, like what is it? At the end of the day, do we do things because we genuinely just love the Lord? And this is our reasonable, it's our reasonable service. It's the least we can do is to give our lives back to God. Amen. Let's stand in the, in the building. We're going to close in prayer. Those who are watching online, we're just going to have a time of prayer. God, we just want to sit in your presence. Thank you for your word. God, you're full of plot twists. You're full of wonder. You're always surprising us. You're always keeping us on our toes. You're always giving us new things to think about. So even as we sit in this story, God, I pray that we will look at the lives of these two people. And God, we would just become the people who you see in your, in your sight as pleasing. God, we just want to please you. 
We don't want to do things for others to see. We want to have correct motivations before you. God, will you allow us to humble ourselves before you by spending more time in your presence, to gaze on your beauty, to be amazed at your wonder, to be blown away by who you are, God. That's the only way to get low. God, let, help us to receive your grace. Come on, lift your hands if you need to receive more of God's grace, a better revelation of God's grace. That I don't have to do things to make God love me. I don't have to act a certain way to make God love me. Once I receive this grace, I will want to walk right. I will want to live right because I love you so much. Not because it's a rule, but because I love you. So God, let us receive your grace. God, we want more of your grace. Give us a better revelation of your love. God, we love you so much. God, I pray that you would help us to walk this out. God, I just want to lift up those who are listening for the first time. It's like, I, I just really need a better relationship with God. If that's you and you're saying, I just need more of Jesus. God, I need more of you. I need, to, I need this incredible grace. I need this incredible mercy on my life. I am the tax collector. I am the one who, who has done too much, have gone too far, who's living in sin. It's me in need of your mercy. It is me in need of your grace. And everywhere I go, I feel ostracized and marginalized. But God, I come before you asking that you would have mercy on me. If that's you, when you just repeat this prayer after me and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my sins. Some of us need a fresh repentance and just say, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I fall short. I don't meet the mark. God, I'm sorry. But I invite you into my life. God, I want to receive your love and your grace. God, use me to be a testimony of what you can do in somebody's life when they are filled with your power. Help us to follow you all the days of our lives. God, we love you so much.